let's take out our Bibles and learn together. When God enters into a situation, that situation is transformed and always for the better. In fact, that situation and those who are part of it, if they receive the work of the Lord in their life, they are going to equally be transformed and they will become instruments of God's glory. That is, God will use them in order to reflect who he is and what he wants to accomplish. Unfortunately, we saw last week when we began this study of the book of Isaiah, we saw that Judah, and for the most part, the book of Isaiah deals with that southern kingdom known as Judah. And the capital, of course, is Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And we've seen how that city initially, as God begins to speak of it through the prophet Isaiah, we see that Judah, there's one primary word that can be used to describe it, and that is wicked. But God, as I said, if he is invited, if his presence is invited into one's life, into a situation, he will indeed transform it. And with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 1. The book of Isaiah chapter 1. Now, in actuality, this first chapter gives us a great view of the entire book of Isaiah. I mean, we can summarize the prophecy of Isaiah in this way. God is displeased with his people. His people are unholy. They are wicked. They are far removed from his will, his purposes, his character. But through God's forgiveness, his grace, and his mercy, Judah will be transformed. And Judah will become an instrument of of righteousness, making that which is unrighteous righteous and making that which is unholy holy. In other words, we'll see that God's people, they become an instrument whereby God accomplishes his purposes through them. And look with me, if you would, to this, this 18th verse. Notice that God is revealing truth and the first truth that he reveals is his nature to forgive. Verse 18, he says, come please. Very significant that we see that Hebrew word na, which is a term of, of beseeching. It is a strong request in the most polite terms. And I think that really says something about the nature of God. I mean, here he is, and he wants to do a work of grace, a work of mercy. He wants to forgive the people, and he invites them to receive that in the kindest, in the most polite manner. Verse 18, he says, come please. And the next word is a word of argument. But biblically, argument is for the purpose of arriving at that which is right, arriving at the truth. So it's not a, a term of, of rejection or contention and such. It is a word of, here, let's consider this and let's arrive at the proper conclusion. So come, please. I believe most English Bibles say, let us reason together. It literally says, let us argue, says the Lord. And then he says, since your sins, they are like scarlet. He goes on and says, as, as snow, they shall be white. So here's that picture of transformation a change a change where that which is unholy can become holy that which is stained with sin as the term scarlet 
uh, conveys, we see now there's purity in the term snow, white as snow. And notice that that word for white is making white. And it's God who is the only one can bring about such a transformation. He says, since red as, as crimson, he goes on, as wool they shall be. So everything is going to reflect a change. A change that, that speaks of those characteristics that God finds pleasing. And he does the work in us. Verse 19. He's making this offer, this invitation. But notice what he says in the next verse, verse 19. If you desire, and it's not the normal word for desire. Primarily, we see the word uh, ratzon or the word chafetz. But, but here, there's even a stronger word. So if you really, really desire, he says, if you desire, and how do we show that desire? That's intense will that we have to, to receive the workmanship of God in our life. It says, you shall hear. Now, this change begins because people are listening to God, hearing his revelation. And let me say with all assurance that it's when you listen to God. And how do you listen to him? Through his word. It is when you hear the word of God that this great transformation, this change can take place in your life. And it's only the word of God. And it's by hearing. Why is hearing emphasized? Because biblically, there's a connection between hearing and faith. Faith, the scripture says, comes by hearing. So once more, he says... If you desire and if you will listen, then there's an outcome. He says, the good of the land you will eat. That is, you will be partakers of the goodness of the world that we live in. The goodness, tuv ha'aretz, the goodness of the land. Now, God, notice his nature. God is revealing an important truth about who he is and how he behaves. We have a group of people, and the group of people are the children of Israel. And we see that they have been rebellious. They have not participated but done the opposite of what God's will is. But nevertheless, God who is rich in mercy, who is abundant in grace, who stands ever present to forgive, this one reaches out with a polite, with a strong invitation in order that this transformation that he and only he can bring about in one's life can be a reality. But we need to desire it. We need to listen to him. And then, and here's the third thing, that God is not just going to invite us, not just forgive us, but he is going to give us the goodness of, of his creation. He says, the goodness of the land you will eat. Verse 20. Now, it's contingent. He reminds us, if you do not refrain, meaning if you do not reject this, if you do not rebel, because if you rebel, if you reject this, if you rebel against it, what's the outcome? He says, Cherf te uchlu. The sword will devour. And the implication is devour his people. And notice, God is serious about this because this verse ends, Ki pi Hashem diber. Ki pi Hashem diber for the mouth of of the Lord has spoken. So God is willing, he's inviting, he's capable, he is generous, but 
We need to be willing to respond with a great desire. So we need to pause and ask ourselves, do we really want a a heavenly transformation in our life where we belong to the kingdom of heaven and not to this world? We might be in this world, residents of it, but our citizenship, as Paul proclaims, our citizenship is in the kingdom. And God wants to work in our life. Remember, the scripture says we are his workmanship. He wants to work in our life to bring about a change where we reflect our character is a kingdom character and we become an example of of his truth and his work in this world. That we might be a source of an invitation for others to come and experience the goodness that we have received through the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, and the provision of God. Look now to verse 21. Now he's made the invitation in these three verses, 18, 19, and 20. And in verse 21, he's going to remind the people of, of their current state how he sees them. Now, he loves them, or he wouldn't be willing to forgive and make this glorious, this kind, this generous invitation. But we need to know us how we really are. And that's why, and this is an important theological truth, if we don't understand sin, we're not a candidate for salvation. I want to say that again. If we don't understand sin, from God's perspective, then we're really not a candidate for sin. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be experts in understanding everything about sin, but when the Bible says, thou shall not, and it's clear, it is easy to understand, God says, don't do that. And if you say, well, I I disagree with that. I, I don't think that's a sin. I think that behavior is acceptable. I think it's a good thing to do. Now, if you have that mindset, you are not in a condition in order to receive requests, the mercy of God. Now, hear what I said very carefully. I did not say if someone says, yes, that is a sin, it is an abomination to God, he doesn't want me to do that, and I agree. We ought not do it. I should not do that. But I struggle with that. Then if that case, if this is your reality, then most certainly you are a candidate for salvation. We will not find the strength to turn away from sin without finding salvation first. Because through salvation, we receive the Holy Spirit, and it's Him, the Holy Spirit in our life, that gives us the proper perspective and the proper power to walk in obedience with God. But even, and this is an important truth, even in our condition of unregeneration, meaning this, we're still lost, dead. What does dead mean? Separated from God. But God, nevertheless, those who are dead in their trespasses and sin, they still have, to a certain degree, a conscience. They can read the scripture, even in the state of lostness, and agree with with much of it. For example, one should not steal, one should not murder. That's revelation from God. And most people have the capacity to say, yes, Stealing is wrong. Yes, murder is is sinful. It is an offense. It ought not be done. What causes that? One's conscience. So we can agree and discern to a certain degree enough to say, yes, that is sinful, and I ought not do that. If you're there, then you're a candidate for salvation. But if you say, no, I don't think that's sinful. Yeah, I I realize the Bible says it is, but I reject that. Then you are not in the, the location where you're a candidate 
for that gospel message. Look, if you would, to verse 21. He says, reminding Israel of their current condition. He asks, how? And the subject is the Kiryat Neimanah, a faithful city. Now, I mentioned to you that, that for the most part, there is clearly an emphasis upon Judah, that southern kingdom, and Jerusalem, its capital, the holy city. And here he's speaking concerning Jerusalem, and he says, how has this faithful city become a harlot? Now, what he's speaking about when we see, for the most part, harlotry in, in the prophets, the real issue is idolatry. So we see that even in the city of Jerusalem, there is idolatry. And not just some, but the city is, is full of idolatry. He asks, how has the faithful city, how has it become a harlot? He says, I have filled it with justice and righteousness, righteousness dwells in her city is ear. It's a feminine noun. So we say righteousness dwells in it. But, but what happens? Instead of justice and righteousness, which God has placed in that city, what's there? Well, he says, there is murderous activity. There are murderers that are welcome there. And it gets worse. He gets very, very precise. He says, your silver has become, and we'll use the word dross. What's that? Dross is a, a very inadequate, a poor quality. It is those things that are in the metal that needs to be, the metal needs to be refined and the dross needs to be removed. But this is not the case with Jerusalem and with the inhabitants of Jerusalem. No, it is full of, dross is another word we might say for impurities. So your silver has become impure. And most Bibles will say wine, but it's not the word yain. It's a word for liquor, a, a hard drink, we might say. And he says, your, your drink has been polluted or, or lessened with water. So all in all, we see that things have, have changed and impurity, there's a lessening. There is not the measure that God says is proper among the children of of Israel verse 23 your leaders this is the word sar we know the term sar shalom the prince of peace but sar in modern Hebrew it is a word for a cabinet official a high-ranking official in the government and he says your your leaders your leaders sorarim now this is found this word is found in the book of Deuteronomy. And remember this rebellious son? And this son is so rebellious, he will not take education. He cannot be reproved. He is wholly committed to that which is sinful. And what is done with such a young man? His parents, they come out to the elders of the city at the gate, and they say that we have trained this young man. We have taught him truth, but he is rebellious through and through. He will not submit to our instruction, our punishment. And then what happens? Well, not to get in great detail, but if the community that they reside in agrees, these are parents that have disciplined him. They have trained him. He knows right from wrong, but he chooses wrong. And if it reaches such a state of rebelliousness, this child is stoned to death. So it's one for an extreme rebellious young man. 
And that same word is used here to describe the leadership of Judah. They had become a band of robbers, and each one of them loves a bribe. So they're not interested in justice. They're not interested in reflecting the character, the truth, the justice of God. But what do they want? They want money. They are looking for a bribe, each one of them. Each one pursues payments. Now, this is just another uh, synonym for a bribe. But the first time it's in the singular, the second time it's in the plural, which means, I mean, they, it's not a one-time thing. Now, a one-time thing is, is wrong. It is sinful. But it is worse to do the same sin over and over and over. And this is the state of the leadership of Judah. And we read at the end of verse 23, the orphan, you do not judge, meaning you do not provide justice for the orphan. You do not plead his cause. And likewise, the contention of the widow, a widow oftentimes is ex exploited, oppressed. She comes seeking justice. And it says the leaders don't plead her cause. They don't contend for her. And verse 24 Therefore, declares the Lord God of hosts. Now, usually we find the expression, the Lord of hosts, or the Lord God. But it is rare here to see this expression. Let me read it in Hebrew. Ha-adon Hashem Sevot. A very strong term for this supreme God who is totally able and in control. He says, therefore declares the Lord God of hosts, Avir Yisrael, the night, and this is a term of great respect, like the night of the round table from history. This is a night one that has great, great character, great ability. He is someone that has done something wonderful and has received that status as a knight. So the knight of Israel, he says, Hoy, how awful. Now, this is the word for capturing the attention. If something does not happen, how awful it's going to be. For God says something, and remember, when we're doing a book study, which we have been doing now for several years, going through individual books of the Bible. And one of the things that people should do when they study a book is to, to find, locate, if there's vocabulary that repeats over and over in this particular book. And we're coming to such a word. Now, this word is nun chet mem nacham. And it's a word of comfort. But in the scripture, it's usually tied to the work of Messiah relating to redemption. But there's another aspect of it. Something is done that brings comfort to God, that is, it, it meets his requirements in order for him to, to be at peace with one or with a certain circumstance. Sometimes that is judgment, that one judges that, and because of that judgment, God is comforted from that, that situation, that unrighteous situation. Conversely, God can find comfort, and this is how we find it mostly in the book of Isaiah. Because one, and frequently, it's a messianic prophecy. That Messiah acts, he does, he behaves in order that through his work of redemption, his work of justification, what he does brings that situation to a new situation, a new status. And that status brings comfort to God. He upholds it. 
So if you look here in, in verse 24, this one, this Lord who is powerful, this, this knight of Israel, he says, Hoy, I will be comforted from my enemies. So those who, this is what he's saying. Remember that word, hoy. My enemies, I'm going to find comfort. It's revealing initially those who are his enemies that he is going to see their judgment and their, their destruction. He says, and I will have vengeance from my enemies. So we have the word tsar and the word oyev. Now, their synonyms, they mean, they mean an enemy or an opponent, one who is in opposition to the things of God. So God says here two things. Notice, he says, I will be comforted and I will exert vengeance. Now, in Hebrew, the word vengeance, we see it here, is a word, nun kuf. Men. Now, nun chet mem, necham, this is nakam, sounds very similar, but a very different meaning. But there's a relationship. Because vengeance, oftentimes we think of vengeance as an act of revenge, getting even, an eye for an eye, so to speak. But this is not what we learn from the biblical revelation concerning vengeance. Vengeance. See, you and I really can't take biblical vengeance. We can act in a way to get revenge. We ought not, but, but people do that. We can act in a way for retribution. You, you knock out my teeth, I'll knock out your teeth. Now, that's how many people see that, but you really, the term an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth, a burn for a bird means that the punishment be equal, that it should be a fitting punishment, not, well, you uh, 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 poked out my eye, now I get to do yours. That doesn't settle anything. It doesn't make you feel better in the long term. So there's a payment, there's an equality for that act. But this is something very different. This is vengeance. Now, we hear the word vengeance in English, we think of one thing. But when you look at it in the New Covenant, it is comprised of two words. Dikesune, which is righteous, and ek, which is from. So vengeance, that act, is not about revenge, retribution. It is behaving in a way that righteousness is manifested that's what the scripture's telling us. And that's what God's going to do. And that's why he's going to have comfort. Look at verse 25. Now, 25 tells us what God's going to do. And how he is indeed a redeemer. He is going to do that work. He realizes the spiritual condition of Judah. His covenant people. But nevertheless, God's going to do something. Look at verse 25. He says, I will turn my hand upon you. Now, from the context, we think, well, that is a, a turning his hand for smacking, punishing, striking. But, but notice what he says here. I will turn my hand upon you, and I will refine as purity your dross. Remember dross, it speaks about uh, those impurities in a metal. Specifically, the previous example was silver. And this word here that begins this, this second part of the verse, it has to do with refining. When metal is melted down, the dross and the good quality of metal separate. All the impurities rise up so you can remove them. And that's what the hand of God is going to do. And it's that activity that produces righteousness, that vengeance. Secondly, he says, and I will remove all 
and this is a word for we can use that same word duros again but it's a different hebrew word instead of speaking about the impurities that's in a metal this word is is better understood as an inadequate and inferior type of metal so it's metal it's pure metal but it's not of a good quality so he's saying i'm going to get rid of all the impurities and all those things that are are not of the highest quality i'm going to remove as well verse 26 and i'm going to restore i will restore your judges as at the beginning and your counselor as the beginning now the first word is rishon the second word is techia two words which means at first or at the beginning so the image here is that of restoration and if there's going to be justice and righteousness then there has to be those that are judges and those that are counselors those who understand what is righteous and what is unrighteous he says and afterwards all this is based upon whose activity god's activity he's bringing about he's doing it he says and afterwards this city this righteous city you shall be called meaning you'll be called a righteous the righteous city and the city of faithfulness or a faithful city verse 27 what city are we talking about well i mentioned the area is judah the city is of course jerusalem but notice the change in words instead of jerusalem it's the word Sion or Zion. And I've shared with you so frequently that although we're talking about the same, same location, there's a significant difference between Jerusalem and Sion. Jerusalem is the present day city. Sion is that same city, but in a kingdom state. And this gives the reader indication what god is speaking about what he's going to do it is something for this transition a final transformation from this world into the kingdom of god so he says sion with justice you will be redeemed and her captives meaning those who are taken captive from her it says that they're going to be redeemed with what with righteousness now notice here two words mishpat and tzedakah these two things justice and righteousness these are two adjectives that describe the kingdom of god and you know what else they should describe those who have received the redemption through the blood of messiah we should be living righteously we should be executing justice that's what we're called to do that's the transformation that change that god wants to bring upon his people verse 28 in contrast to that this righteousness this justice he says they shiver shiver is destruction it speaks about annihilation and he says the destruction of the transgressor and the sinner together meaning simply god he is going to those who are unrepentant those who do not receive the grace the forgiveness the mercy of god those let's go back to an earlier scripture look if you would to to verse to verse 19 if you don't desire strongly what god's offering if you're not willing to listen to him then you're not going to experience goodness rather you are going to experience this shiver this destruction so he says let's go back to our text verse 28 
and destruction of the transgressor and the sinner will be together. Those who abandon the Lord, they will, will be ashamed or they will be literally, better to say here, they will be consumed. For Now here's the word for, for shame. For shameful is the one, and it uses the word here for a tree, a tree that is used for idolatry. So those who practice idolatry, they will be made ashamed. Those that, that covet, you who covet that, he says, you will be, be embarrassed. Now, it's a word literally for, for digging. It's like putting your head into the sand because of shame, hiding yourself. We see people all the time that have been arrested. They're going to, to trial, perhaps, and they take their coat and they cover it up over their face in, in shame. This is what it's depicting here. Look again at the text. It says, and they will be ashamed of their gardens. These are places of idolatry which you have chosen. Verse 30. For you shall be as this tree. Now, simplistically today, it's an oak tree. So you'll be like this oak tree, but it's a tree of idolatry whose leaves, its leaves wither up and whose gardens don't have any water in it. Verse 31, it says, And it shall be that the one who is strong, this one's going to be made like, like tinder. What's that? Well, the word here is used when you want to fire, oftentimes you put, you put different things in that easily catch fire to help it start. So he says, this one who is strong, you're going to be like a, a stubble or hay that's used to start a fire. And his action, this one who is strong, his actions are going to be the spark. So his actions are going to ignite the fire that consumes him. And it says both of them, the one who does it and the actions itself, it says both of them are going to be burned together. And there's going to be, it says, ve'en mechabe. What's that? Well, this is the modern Hebrew word for a, a fireman. So there's not going to be anyone there to extinguish this fire. Meaning this judgment, this, this consuming wrath of God is going to go on and on and on. So this scripture gives us a very good description of God. And it reveals to us that this God who is holy and righteous, that he's forgiving, he's merciful, he's gracious, he's faithful. But because he is faithful and holy, he also, for those who do not desire redemption, those who will not listen to him, those who will not accept his standards, those are going to be consumed ashamed and embarrassed for all eternity, being a recipient of the eternal judgment of God. Now, I hope you see that there is a great dichotomy, two different, different experiences. And what it reveals to us is this. You're either going to have it very good. You remember he says you'll eat the good of the land. You're either going to have it very good in his kingdom, or you're going to have it very bad in eternal condemnation and damnation and judgment. And it's all up to you. You make the choice. Now, I realize that our Reformed friends, they want to say, no, God chooses you or rejects you. This is not the case. When you look at the implications of what God is saying, is that it's a call, it's an invocation, invitation to listen and respond. And although God, he provides the change for us, we have to desire it. 
And what causes that desire? When we encounter his word. When we hear this wonderful God extend to us mercy. When we are convicted by what God says, here's my standards. And when we reject those and transgress them. When we hear that, we can be grieved. And it's this grieving that comes from knowing that we have been displeasing to God. That that opens up. That brings about God's activity in our life. That leads us to say yes to him. God, he is great and great things has he done. Well, I'll stop with that until next week. And we move into Isaiah and chapter 2. Until then, shalom from Israel.